Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development, where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page, and please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Michael Yinger about hiring biases and their long-term effects on organizations. Michael Yinger, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you, John. It's a pleasure to be here. I look forward to our conversation. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be with you today. I'm super excited to chat about hiring biases. Uh, there's lots of discussion in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space about uh, bias and those sorts of things, how we can limit it in un- implicit bias and unconscious bias. There's so many negative aspects to that. We're going to touch on some of those, but really we will also today want to focus on the long-term negative effects on organizations when hiring biases are part of the process. We're all human. We're not perfect. Of course, there's going to be um, biases in what we're doing. So we need to figure out how we can mitigate those and the, the, the negative outcomes of those as much as possible and to put in place systems that will help us uh, to, to uh, weed those out as much as possible, hopefully to have a healthy, safe uh, workplace environment where everyone is needed, wanted, included, where they have a genuine sense of belonging, they can bring their whole authentic self to work. So that's what we'll be discussing today. As we get started, I wanted to share Michael's bio with everybody. Michael Yinger is a high performance, forward thinking executive with 20 plus years of experience in building teams, managing global organizations, and providing strategic guidance to C suite and board of directors. As co founder and CEO of Resume Civ, an HR tech startup, Michael is responsible for strategic direction and operational oversight in an ever-changing industry. Again, pleasure to have you, Michael. Anything else you would like to share with listeners by way of your background or personal context before we dive on in? Well, I I appreciate it. That was sure um, on point, John. I've I've been in talent acquisition about 20 years, and I think it gives me a pretty good perspective of how things have evolved and, and perhaps where things are going. I won't pretend to have a crystal ball, but it certainly helps to have that background. Yeah, nobody has the crystal ball, but we can look at past experience, we can look at trends, and we can forecast and try to scenario plan for the future. And I think that's super, super important. Uh, So why don't you lay out for us, again, you're you're very experienced in the space, lay out for some of the typical types of bias that tend to find their way into the hiring process, Uh, because let's name it first, and then we can get into like how we can start to eliminate or minimize the impacts of those. And then we can talk about the long-term impacts. Sure. I would say that there are two main types of bias. There's explicit bias, and then there's unconscious bias. And you touched on those in your intro, John. Explicit bias, you find where people are choosing based on some sort of demographic, the kind of people who they want to work with them, they want to work in their company. And... So that has obviously an impact on the the makeup of the organization and perhaps even the success of the organization. If you um, follow some of the stats that are out there, a, a diverse organization tends to be more productive, tends to be more profitable, et cetera. Then there's the uh, unconscious bias where we don't really know that we're doing it. And often you can you can see this not because there is deliberate exclusion, but more because there seems to be a certain kind of inclusion. People tend to hire people who maybe look like them, 
think like them as opposed to uh, really getting to those that are perhaps the most qualified, those who can bring more information to the organization. Both need to be tackled um, on the human side as well as to a certain extent they can be tackled on the technology side. At some point, I say it to a certain extent on the technology side because at a certain point, there is a human involved. There is somebody making a decision, right? Unless you're abdicating all responsibility to a, a computer. And then you've got the whole question of how do we ensure that there's no implicit bias in this, the technology as well? I, I read an interesting article not too long ago that was looking at the ethics of AI. And if you, if you consider the concept of, well, you want to have AI that's helping with decision making uh, that doesn't have implicit bias. Okay, that's not, that sounds like a good thing to have, right? Who's deciding what unbiased looks like? Somebody is still having to make a decision on the to help the computer learn to operate. So there's there's some really interesting challenges here that that I think we're just beginning to deal with. And and what's uh, observationally when AI first hit HR tech, it just exploded. It was everywhere, and there's still a lot of it out there. But people have dialed back a little bit. They're a little more cautious. And of course, the government's getting involved and. And, and interestingly enough, a lot of the government regulation actually puts it back on the hiring company and on the technology company to make sure that their technology isn't biased. So it, it, it falls to the, to the employers as well to ensure that the technology is doing a good job as best it can in assisting in the uh, particularly the screening process. Yeah. And like you said, there, there's more and more companies, more and more HR tech firms that are you know, trying to assist hiring managers in that screening process, either through uh, scanning through resumes and application materials to pull out the best, quote unquote, best um, mm -hmm. submissions or uh, video interviews and analyzing the video interview responses and body language and all that to decide who's the best uh, candidates. Um, all of that, you know, again, we can say it's all driven by AI, so it's unbiased, but AI is trained via the inputs that are put into it, right? And so if there's, yep. there's biased inputs, there's going to be biased decisions and outcomes. That's just the way it works. And, and so we have to be super careful about that. And, you know, people, it may not be the intention of anybody to have those right. biases systematized, systematized and embedded, but that is the outcome. And so inadvertently, we could actually work to reinforce the systems of bias and prejudice and, uh, and uh, injustice within organizations when we're trying to do the opposite. So let's just be thoughtful and careful about that. Right. Um, some of the, you know, when, when uh, some of the first HR tech companies doing video, AI video analysis of interviews started to come out several years ago, um, that was the big new thing. And everyone was so excited about it. What I've noticed in just the last year or so is there's more companies now doing that, but they're differentiating themselves specifically by saying, we're only using the AI to analyze the, the language that's used, the, what people say in response to the questions, not the body language, not the way, not their facial express, expressions, not the way they look, because all of that then just has more embedded bias in it. So, so even tech, HR tech companies are trying to wrestle with this and try to figure out what's the balance uh, to find good fit, to find, you know, what is going to help the organization succeed without overstepping and inadvertently, disproportionately, negatively impacting a particular population of individuals who might be applying for positions. Yeah, no, it's, it, it, you're hitting right on the the a conundrum, if you will, that people are struggling with, how do I ensure that I'm providing unbiased um, evaluation? There's there's another direction that, that a, a couple of technology firms have gone, which is to take the resume and redact it. So the person who's reviewing the results doesn't know name, location. Uh, some even go so far as to take off uh, dates and company names so that it really comes down to what is in a sense a skills assessment and, and there's nothing wrong with the skills assessment that's that's a that's a good way to begin to sort of filter the qual quantity of people that you're seeing 
the the intention of these of these redacting tools is to take any reference to any sort of demographics out of the picture and allow for the decision to go forward based on skills. Again, that's great. That that perhaps gets you to a balanced, well, I won't say balanced slate, it gets you to a slate that's created without any bias uh, built into it. Somebody still has to interview them, somebody's still gonna talk to them. And so there's a whole nother element and there's a lot of work that's done in this area as well around training people to recognize their own bias or having interview teams uh, set up in a way to balance what's going on in the organization. And often the starting point is, you know, you talked at the, at the top, John, about DE&I. Well, D, diversity, typically is, those are the numbers. Those are what you're trying to hit. And then you've got the equity, how you're treating people and inclusion, uh, you know, are you creating an environment that everybody's part of it? And then belonging is, is a whole new facet to it, which is really fascinating. And so what's going on in that, in that diversity? Are you using that to determine how many people you're talking to, where you're finding those people? There's some really interesting challenges there. Uh, when um, back in the day, we would have clients with, uh, who would have their ETS set up that recruiters couldn't tell what the, uh, the demographics, either the gender or ethnicity it was of the candidate. Now you can say something about the name and some of those kinds of things. Maybe you can figure things out that way. The idea was just to, it, as much as possible, have the people who are filtering filter based on what's required for the job and what are the skills of the person who's coming to the table. And then to ensure that you've got the, a, a, a good mix of candidates, a good mix of demographics, that really comes down to where are you looking for people? What are you using to attract them? How are your, your job descriptions written such that people will be interested in applying for the job? So it's a multifaceted um, opportunity that organizations are taking on as they address the fact that, that perhaps they don't represent the public that they're serving or the geography where they're located. You know, there are any number of reasons why you'd, you'd think your, 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 your diversity stats are off and, and what do you do about it? Yeah, excellent, excellent. So I think we've laid out uh, a, a good foundation around uh, some of the types of bias, even the, the HR tech and the the, the AI uh, bias that can still be embedded within systems. So what? Let's let's just talk about what happens if and when these biases persist. Despite our best intentions, our best efforts, we still have bias in the process because there's still subjectivity uh, in the hiring process, no matter how we slice it. Uh, what can that do to the organization? Its long term ability to be strategic, innovative, uh, and to bring value to the market? Well, it's it, interesting that a lot of the statistics that you see around this are not so much what does it do the organization that is not focused on uh, DE&I, rather, what do organizations that are focused on DE&I able to achieve that other organizations aren't? So it, it's, you know, it's chicken or the egg, I guess. And, and so the stats are pretty, pretty surprising. Um, two and three times uh, the productivity, engagement numbers that can be 30 and 40% higher, uh, the um, cash flow numbers that are better, lower turnover, higher re retention, however you want to look at it. So what, I guess the, the, the sort of the high level, although simple answer to your question is, what happens to an organization that isn't paying attention to their DE&I they're not going to perform as well as other organizations in their space that are. So they are putting themselves at a competitive disadvantage because of how they're building their workforce and the kind of things that they're going to get from their workforce. That the underlying, the interesting sort of underlying uh, feeling, if you will, is that people want to work in a diverse work in a diverse workplace that represents, if not their community, at least society at large. That, that People are, are not as comfortable and not as effective working in organizations that are solely, uh, you know, in one way or another. And so it's, you know, is this, is this because you're hiring the wrong people or is it because the environment that you're creating, there are different reasons that drive this. I think that the, the 
simple answer is organizations that aren't paying attention to this are putting themselves at a disadvantage against others that are. And it's it's been shown time and time again from uh, the the stats that are out there. Yeah, lots of research in this space. I've done a good amount yeah. of this research myself, both uh, you know as a consultant in, in the consulting work that I do in the consulting reports, but also as an academic in the, the peer-reviewed academic literature and the, the surveys and the research that I've done in that space. It's pretty clear. And you know, every now and then, and I think more and more people are recognizing it and willing to just openly acknowledge, yes, it's pretty clear. Every now and then I still run into people that try to make the argument that there's no clear... Uh, benefit to organizations focusing on DEI. And I just think they're, you know, they just have their head in the sand. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know where they're coming from. Because e I mean, even if even if they're right, that, you know, it's not going to increase creativity or innovation, it's not going to reduce turnover, it's not going to increase customer retention, customer satisfaction metrics, all these things that ultimately drive value. Um, even if they're right about that and it's no, a company's no better off for doing DEI stuff and, and just trying to, you know, be as fair and, and, uh, inclusive as possible, even if they're, they're correct about that consumers still want to patronize companies that are focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so right. even, even then you, you're, you're going to set yourself up for failure um, just in the marketplace because people are going to vote with their feet and you're going, your sales are going to be lower. You're, uh, you're not going to have as loyal customers. And frankly, we, we see, I mean, it's just so crystal clear uh, that even if the innovation and creativity stuff is a ruse, which it isn't, but let's say it was, you're still in the, in the, the, the fight for talent in the labor market. If you're not focusing on DEI stuff uh, and you're not truly authentically trying to, to move the needle and make your organization better, you're not going to attract and retain good That's diverse exactly talent it. and pe people are going to go elsewhere. So pretty soon yeah. you're just going to be completely irrelevant as an organization because you're not going to have good people. And it's the people that produce the stuff. It's the people that create the products and services and deliver it to customers. And if you don't have good people, then your, your company just can't survive in the long term. Who wants to do business with you and who wants to work for you and all those are tied up in your brand and if your brand is perceived as not supporting what people are looking for especially now this is one of the uh, another one of the interesting impacts post covid is because people have choices because we still have many more jobs available in the economy than we have people to fill them people are voting with their conscience if you will or their preference you know, it's, it's, are, are there people like me working there? It, you know, is, is, is the kind of thing that people are thinking about, or am I going to be an outlier? And it's, uh, as you say, even, even without the, the demonstrated performance benefits, there is this whole issue of, of what do you attract with your brand? All those things tie into your performance, right? If your brand is not attracting the good people, then you're not going to be as productive. If your brand is is not attracting consumers, you're not going to sell as much. It's it's uh, it it in in so, it, it's interesting that it, you know some industries, some companies have just they, they know this and they just do it right. Others, you're right. There may be still some pushback. I think the uh, I don't think the jury's out on this one. I think it's just taken time for adoption to to work its way through. Yeah. And, and some people just are resistant to change. Right. Yeah. And, and you, you, I mean, there's a segment uh, right now I'm talking about within the U S um, I know it's different around the world, but within the U S if we just think about kind of ideologies, broader ideologies around politics, religion, social ideologies, economic ideologies, there is a sizable segment of the U S that really just wishes things would go back to the way they were to a more idyllic, quote unquote, idyllic time, um, you know, and, and so all this push towards diversity, equity, and inclusion is scary. It feels like it's something that's going to um, uh, challenge the status quo and the power structures and the, and, and how certain populations have been benefiting in this, in the current system for a long time. And because that's being disrupted, there's, there's a, a sizable segment of the population that simply wants it to be back quote unquote, the way it was not 
you know, not acknowledging the fact that the way it used to be had all sorts of problems with it, right? I mean, we, we can't just go back to like this idyllic, this, this fake idyllic time of like the 50s and 60s and say everything was so wonderful then. I mean, we, there was so much turmoil back then and just civil rights alone um, and gender rights and, and all sorts of things, right? So, so looking backwards to try to get things back to the way they were, it's always problematic. We, and, we, and the reality is in the future, in, in the current modern workplace, and as we look forward to the future of work, you know, say five, 10, even 20, 30, 40 years out, the world is going to continue to change at a rapid pace, even an exponentially rapid pace. We need to be able to learn to adapt and to adopt new technologies, new approaches, things that will help us to be successful. Looking backwards isn't going to be the solution to that. So, you know, for anyone listening who may be, you know, tempted to s- dismiss this conversation and say, you know, no, really, I, I'm really, com- I'm, I'd rather have fit within my company, meaning I'd rather have a whole bunch of people that look like me, act like me, talk like me, think like me, and then we're all comfortable with each other. You can try that, but you're good. I mean, you're just going to be completely irrelevant uh, in the modern world of work if you don't uh, embrace and lean into uh, DE&I stuff, try to get rid of bias and try to just be uh, more healthy and safe for everyone in your organization. Well, you know, as, as you were going through that, John, there's a, there's a, there's a tactical issue that does have some relevance that it, uh, companies have to be aware of. Let's say you have a certain mix and your intention is to change that mix to something else, implying that you're going to bring in demographics that are not present today. That can be a sensitive issue to the workforce. Am I going to be replaced because I'm not the right whatever? And so you do have to take that into account. If you're growing, well, okay, then you can, you know, you can, you know, overcorrect in a certain way. Maybe that's not the right word, but you can over um, uh, influence in a certain way. It is something to think about. How do you how do you actually change the diversity piece of DE and I without causing major disruption in the organization? Uh, you know, are, are you going to get rid of people so that you can change your mix? Or is this going to be through attrition? Again, if you're through growth, so there there are some very tactical issues that companies have to address. And then you add, let's just add geography. I, I had a client who uh, had uh, call centers in one of the northeastern states, and they wanted to have a much different demographic mix than what they had. And we said to them, "Well, that's fine. You're going to have to relocate your call center because that you can't find." the demographics that you're looking for, where you're located, where people are willing to commute. So there, you know, there are some real issues that companies have to face. And then, and then are the games that people play. If, you know, are you looking at the demographics um, as a whole, in which case you might be pretty good. Let's say you're a hospitality company, likely you're gonna have pretty good demographics as a whole because certain jobs are gonna, uh, you know, attract certain demographics. Is that true all the way through? Are you looking at your at your manager ranks, at your executive ranks, at your technical ranks, to to ensure that you're really affecting the diversity across the organization, or are you just living on this idea that well, you know, we we've got so many people, we're we're okay, and uh, you know, this this is certainly true um, at the at the at the senior levels, right? Are, you know, if you're looking just say for example, you're looking to change the mix of of males and females. And, you know, organizationally, you've got a good mix, but then you get to a certain level and suddenly that's all off again. Well, you know, those are the kind of things you, you have to take into account. And then you add to it the things that you were talking about. It, this is an important issue and it takes guidance from the top of the organization for, for there to be a true positive impact. Yeah, very well said, Michael. Michael, I note the time. This has just been a fantastic conversation and the time has flown by. I'm going to have to let you go here in just a minute. But before we wrap up for today, uh, I just want to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can connect with you and find out more about your work and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Sure. You can reach me at uh, my work email is michael at resumesiv.com. You can find me on LinkedIn, Mike Inger. You can find me on Facebook. You find me on Twitter. And uh, as, as we've said a couple of times, I'll just give you the sort of the last word. It's using the right technology, using the right tools, and using the right training 
because the technology and the tools aren't going to get you there. The process is not going to get you there because there's still people making decisions. And you have to look at the kind of decisions that your folks are making to see that they're in line with whatever your goals are. You got to have goals first, of course. It takes, you, you have to watch this and you can't be satisfied once you hit a number because that's just a number. It's how are you dealing with the new folks that you've got in the organization? How are you making them, you know, ensuring there's equity, ensuring there's inclusion, ensuring they feel like they belong. All those things speak to an organizational effort going forward. And John, I thank you for giving me the time to be on this topic. And, and you're right, we could keep going if we wanted to. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Michael. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Michael and his team can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page. And please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.